So we've talked a good bit about BGP peering, BGP updates, basic BGP operation. Now it's time to talk about something that's a little more advanced, which you'll run into a lot, is just the concept of BGP communities. I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about the uses of communities, just a little bit in this section. We'll run into BGP communities as we go through other parts of understanding how to deploy and how to use BGP in later sections in this BGP training. So this just kind of gives you a sense or an overview of how BGP communities actually work. There are three basic kinds of BGP communities. The first are just standard communities. These are described in RFC 1997. You can tell from that number it's quite an old RFC. These are an optional transitive attribute, which means that each BGP speaker does not need to process them, but every BGP speaker needs to pass them along to other BGP speakers when they are sending an update or a route along to another speaker. Each community is four octets in length. There are well-known communities and there are ephemeral or not well-known communities. Well-known communities always fall within these two ranges of community numbers, um, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, through FFFF and FFFF through FFFF, FFFF. Um, these are this way because the standard construction of a community is that the first two octets are the AS number of the assigning AS, and the last two octets are the actual information contained in the community itself. Now, this is true for anything that is not well-known. So remember the difference between well-known and not well-known is well-known is something that every BGP speaker should be able to process or understand, and non-well-known or optional are actually things that not every BGP speaker needs to understand. So there are optional transitive communities that are well-known. So that means BGP speakers in general don't always have to process communities. But if they do, they must be able to support all the well-known communities and not necessarily all the optional communities that are out there. Let's talk about two of the well-known communities that are quite useful just to get a sense of what well-known communities might look like. The first of these we want to talk about is no export. Let's say that I have 100 colon colon slash 64 being advertised by A to B and to C here in AS65001. B advertises it to D and C advertises it to D as well. For whatever reason, the operator at AS65001 does not want these routes to go beyond AS65002. That might be because this is a backup route. This could be because this is a longer match, a more specific route, which we'll talk about that using more specific routes to control inbound traffic flow in a much later session of this BGP training. But that's one thing that you might be doing there. How can AS65001 communicate to AS65002 that it does not want this 100 colon colon slash 64 route to be advertised outside of AS65002. This is where the no export community comes in. What no export means is it means I am sending you this route, but I do not want you to advertise it outside of your autonomous system. I don't want you to export it outside of your autonomous system. This is no export. So in this case, when AS65001 sets a filter up or sets up a route map or whatever, so that B and C both send the no export community to D, D will advertise the route to E and F so that every BGP speaker within AS65002 knows about the 100 colon colon slash 64 destination, but F will not advertise the route to G. Again, this is useful in a lot of different deployment situations, and we'll probably run into it later when we talk about deploying BGP in the real world. Now, another one is no advertise. Now, this is slightly different than no export, and this is actually fairly rare. It's very unusual to see no advertise used in the wild. So what's the difference? Again, I have 100 colon colon slash 64 being advertised by A to B and to C. B and C are both advertising this route to D, which will choose the best path between those two. In the case of no advertise, what no advertise says to D is, as a BGP speaker, do not advertise this route to any of your peers at all. So this is very similar to no export, but it just means I don't even advertise it within my AS to any of my peers. So no advertise can mean that E and F no longer even know about this route. Again, why would you do this? 
Uh, one possibility here is that B could be advertising a longer prefix of the 100 colon slash 64 while C is advertising a shorter one. This would cause D to prefer the longer prefix but not to re-advertise the longer prefix into the AS65002 routing table, which reduces the size of the table within AS65002 but still gives you control over how the route is advertised. Again, this is very rare in the real world. Um, I don't know that I've ever seen this deployed in the real world that I can remember. I've been doing this for 30 years, so it's pretty rare. But there are use cases where this could be helpful. Another kind of community is an extended community. These are described in RFC 4360. Again, this is an optional transitive attribute. These are, instead of being four octets in length, they are eight octets in length. The primary reason for pushing out extended communities in the first place was the four octet AS number. Because if you think about it, if you have a four octet community and the first part of the community is supposed to tell you which autonomous system originated that community or stuck that community into a route, then you don't have any room for data. So you have to have a larger community of some type. So this is the extended community. It's eight octets in length. RFC 4360, however, describes much more than just a larger community. The extended community type has a new structure or a structure that the standard community does not. The first bit in the first octet tells you how the community type was assigned. Is it assigned locally or globally? Was it assigned by standard or was it assigned in some other way? The second is it tells you whether the community is transitive or not. So rather than just assuming that the community itself, while extended communities are optional it's transitive, the community itself may not be transitive. So you may want to block a community from traveling on to beyond a speaker that does not understand it or even beyond a local speaker of a certain kind. So this is set if it's a transitive extended community. If this T bit is not set, the transitive community is not carried on through eBGP or IBGP to other BGP speakers. There are some community types that are globally known, and I'll talk about those in just a second, so what some of those are. So these tell the receiver or the processor how to manage or how to process these communities. Some of these community types have a subtype, which can take up one octet, and that leaves six or seven octets for the data. So in the, either case, if there are six or seven octets, you can have either two octets or four octets, taken up out of this set of six or seven octets for the originating AS number. So this gives you some sense that you would have either two or three octets to carry information. Normally you're not carrying a lot of information, you're just carrying a sort of flag like no peer or no advertise or no export or something like that within the extended community. So that is one thing that you'll see. Uh, is extended communities. Now, extended communities are fairly common in the wild. You'll see them uh, a lot, and normally they are formatted as a um, two four octet divided by a colon section. So the first first two and the second two, or something like this. Now let's look at some of the types of extended communities. There is 0x0 or 0x4. This is local to the AS, so it would not transit outside the AS itself. And the first two octets are an AS number. This means that the information contained within the extended community is also local to the AS. It's opaque to anyone else. Note that there are two octets in the AS number. 0x2, 0x42 are four octets in the AS number. Remember we have two and four octet AS numbers so that what we need to have is we need to have two different types in the extended community family to support both of those. 0x1041 um, says that this is information specific to an IPv4 destination. So I can carry information specific to an IPv4 destination. 0x3, 0x43 are opaque which means they're just random stuff that the local AS is stuffed in there and no one else should know how to read or use that information. Other extended community types are route targets. These are used to indicate which BGP speakers could pay attention to this route. Uh, normally, these will be related to a VRF or a virtual Ethernet segment of some type that you have in an L3 VPN or an eVPN overlay 
type of situation in a network. Now we're not going to spend a lot of time on route targets other than in perhaps in EVPN later on. Um, we won't be talking a lot about MPLS, um, RT, and RD in this course because that's yet another huge topic to cover. We have route distinguishers. Now it could be that if you have multiple clients or multiple people who are using your network, they might have overlapping IP address space. How can you distinguish between 10.0.0.0 slash 24 from one customer to another with the same route or the standard 100 colon colon slash 64 route in V6? This is where the route distinguisher comes into play. The route distinguisher actually is unique per customer or per client or per verf so that you can tell exactly where that route fits. Link bandwidth is something that's really not heavily used but was a really cool idea for a while where you could carry the bandwidth, the minimum bandwidth of the link across the path through which a route has passed. This is very much like the bandwidth in EIGRP and the idea being that you could choose a path with no less than X amount of link bandwidth across the entire path. Again, this is not widely used, however. Another type of community that was much more recently um, designed or put out there as a standard, and you can tell from the number, it's RFC 8092, so it's a fairly recent RFC and RFC world, is the large community. Now, the large community has 12 octets. It's a much more structured format. I'm not going to spend a ton of time in the format of large communities here because they are not widely implemented or deployed at this time. But you can go read RFC 8092. It's a pretty simple RFC to read, and you can figure out what the large community format is if you want to. Now, let's talk about one common use for communities that a lot of people may not know about, but is fairly interesting. This is Communities for Data Collection, and this is described in RFC 4384. What we do here is we mark routes with communities based on whether they are learned from a customer, from within a region, whether they're learned from an upstream, whether it's a more specific route versus a less specific route, whether there's a special purpose route, whether it's any cast, lots of different things can be pushed into the community field to indicate something about the route that is interesting to the operator. Now these, these types of communities are not just used for data collection, although they are used for data collection. They're quite useful for an operator to figure out how many AnyCast routes do I actually have? How many routes are being originated from Los Angeles or from Atlanta or from London or from Paris or Prague or whatever it is? They are also useful for troubleshooting. If I know that I should have a route originating in Los Angeles and I see that the route I have is actually originating in London because I can look at the community and tell the difference, I actually know something is wrong in my network and I kind of know where to start looking without having to do a lot of trace routes and everything else. This is actually really useful for enterprise operators as well. Even in data centers, you should probably think about using RFC 4384 style communities to improve your MTTR or to reduce the amount of time it takes you to troubleshoot a network. So let's look at a few examples of these. If I go to a BGP looking glass server and I do a show BGP for say 108.174.1.0 slash 24, I will see that I have six paths available and the best is number six in this particular show IP BGP output. Now what you'll note however is that I have the advertised paths etc etc and I have these communities down here. You'll notice these communities. It's quite interesting because these all start with 2914. Well 2914 happens to be the AS number of NTT communications. So if you go to NTT's website you can likely find their list of communities marked on routes sent to customers. Now they may block other communities that they use internally, but these are the ones they let other people see when they send them out. So for instance, we see here 2914.370. Well, I don't see that in my list. I could probably find it, but I don't have the whole list here right now. Then I have 2914.2000.3000. Again, I don't have these on my list. What I do have is 2914.1004, which tells me this originated, this route originated either in Dallas or Houston, Texas. So this route originated from a router someplace within Dallas or Houston, which is fairly interesting. Now I have another route or another next stop with 2914-1006. This particular version of the route originated in Miami, Florida. Here I have one with 2914-1008. This one originated in Mopitas, California or Mountain View or Palo Alto, somewhere in California, pretty much. Then I have 2914-1005 and again 
this gives me Los Angeles. So this is fairly useful if you're trying to troubleshoot something or understand is to have these kinds of extended communities pushed into your routing table. And again, if you see these communities on routes you're receiving from an upstream provider, it's quite useful to be able to go look at their site and figure out what communities they push onto routes so you can figure out something about the routes themselves. Well, that's it for communities. You'll be hearing a lot more about them in later sections of this BGP training. Thank <laughs> you.